to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario on a beautiful summer's day where we are trying this again. Uh, we may have seen on Twitter a few weeks ago that we teased that we were going to have Christo Avalis on to talk about his new book, The Constant Liberal, Pierre Trudeau, Organized Labor, and the Canadian Social Democratic Left. And we did, in fact, have him on. And then my computer blew up. So we didn't actually air it, but we talked. And because I enjoyed talking to him so much, he's back and gracious enough to return to re-talk about his book. Hi, Christo. Hi, thanks for having me again. Uh, my pleasure. We we did talk, but one of the cool things about this show for me is that it is so conversational, and you know I don't really have that many set questions, so we can just talk about it again, because I enjoyed the conversation last time, and I anticipate enjoying it again. And what I want to start with this time is one of the things that's interesting to me about Pierre Trudeau is that he is sort of this mythical figure in, in, a, in a lot of ways, and yet there's been this renewed interest in him, I think mostly because of Justin Trudeau and the election of the Liberal Party of Canada back in 2015, because we've seen a few other books. Paul Litt's book is the first one that jumps to mind, his Trudeau Mania book that came out recently. But as anyone who's ever researched and written a book knows that these things can't happen in two years, usually, for a well-researched historical book. So here you are coming out with your book about Pierre Trudeau, in this era of a renewed interest of him. So I'm just curious how you have responded to this renewed interest, given that I know this project predates the 2015 election. Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, I I had been kind of working on this kind of on and off, even going back to my undergrad. It was something I was really interested in, and it's something that I knew I wanted to do when I went to grad school. And I started my, you know, my master's degree in 2009. So you know, certainly Justin Trudeau was a was an MP at the time, but you know he was a relatively moderate figure in what was at the time the second party and what would become the third party for for much of my graduate studies. But you know there was certainly an interest in Trudeau. I think you know it came in waves. Certainly, right. Obviously, there was a lot of interest in Trudeau during his life and uh, during his time in politics when he when he rose. A lot of people were interested in him um, because he was he was seen as a you know a very different politician, especially. You know, somebody who would become prime minister, given his background. Uh, then you also have an interest in him, you know, towards the end of his career, as a lot of works are being written to kind of appraise uh, his role in society, his worldview. So that's where you see a lot of really good books, like the the two the two part series by Colin Clarkson, which which was you know they're they're both journalists, but it was really well done, especially for the fact that they didn't have access to the archives, all of the archival papers of Trudeau. Uh, and the first big wave of like scholarly takes, if you will, would probably have been right after his passing in the early 2000s. Mm. And that's where you have John English and Max and Monique Nemi both coming out with multi-volume series on Trudeau. And these are really they're 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 important because you know they're they're great works uh, that 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 really changed how we thought about Trudeau. But but specifically, they're the first to really have full kind of access to Trudeau's own writings. His diaries, his speeches, all of those records that are that are you know kind of behind the archival veil. Um, and in recent years, you're right, there's certainly been a kind of re-approach to him. I don't know if that's driven by Justin Trudeau necessarily, because as you know, there's the uh, the reality that these projects take a lot of time. I think one thing that that drove specifically Paul Litt and and Robert Wright's book was that they were writing at the 50th anniversary. Of kind of Trudeau mania, yeah. Uh, in a in a rough sense, you know, the books both came out in 2016, but in a sense, we're we're basically 50 years out from Trudeau's kind of rise to power. In a sense, you know, 49, 50 years ago, he kind of starts the rise in 67 in some ways. So you know, those books certainly come out from that perspective. But for mine, it was just kind of a, a general interest in Trudeau. It had nothing personally to do with Justin. Although you know, as you know, there there is kind of this this desire to connect. The two, and you know, some of my writing for Active History has kind of been in that vein. I've I've looked at you know Justin Justin versus Pierre and how they've handled it situations, how how Justin's rise was like Trudeau mania, but also how it was different. How Trudeau handled Nixon gives some interesting parallels, uh, limited as they are in some cases, to how Justin might choose to handle or has handled uh, Donald Trump. So you know, kind of looking at all of those things, and you know, the book itself towards the end and the in the conclusion really does have a 
kind of uh, a little bit of a uh, you know a couple pages just kind of on on Justin and his legacy but it's but it's nothing uh, that substantive I suppose and that's the thing that I find interesting in all this rehashing or, or revisiting the Trudeau years the the first Trudeau years back in the the 60s 70s is that for so many people they, they view Justin Trudeau through this lens which I think is inevitable when your father is a prime minister the same thing happened to George W. Bush with H.W. being the president earlier. <laughs> I'm sure the thing, the same thing happened with John Quincy Adams. Like I, I yeah. right? Like I'm I mean, sure, certainly, yeah, yeah. right? Like you, you get viewed through that lens just because you are family. But I, I wonder, is that fair to Pierre Trudeau, or is it even fair to Justin Trudeau? Because there are two individual men who, yes, they're working as prime minister of the same party, but very different eras. And to me, in my reading of both of them very different approaches so like, is this a fair thing that that maybe publicly some people are comparing the two or almost equating them in some ways no yeah i mean is it fair or not i mean i think you know when you when you're justin i mean i think it's a double-edged sword in a sense i mean you can't necessarily you know have all the derived socioeconomic privilege of being the son of a, a millionaire prime minister and then, you know, when it doesn't suit you, kind of jettison it, right? right so, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think, you know, in a sense, just, you know, you know, Justin Trudeau, Doug Ford, both of them are, are beneficiaries of, of the past political successes of their fathers. Even if they, they have different approaches, you know, that's that's something we can't really shy away from. And I think it's important to point that out because, you know, it shows the, you know, from a more political perspective, it shows the profound inequities and of our society, both in equality of condition and equality of opportunity. I mean, you know, Justin is prime minister, in my view, largely because of his father, whereas his father, uh, certainly kind of growing up with a, a family of wealth, uh, you know, wealth derived from, in a sense, quote unquote, new money, uh, you know, Pierre largely ended up prime minister, you know, through his own accord. I, I don't think the same speaks to Justin. So, I, you know, I think I think that's certainly reasonable. And I think, um, you know, there's this great line once, and it was really seized on by, by many people kind of in my social circles, uh, you know, given the political leanings and what have you. That Justin and uh, Christia Freeland, who's one of his key cabinet ministers, of course, and this was the uh, this was before or shortly after she had run in a by-election for him, kind of between the 2011 and 2015 elections, and she said, "Well, increasingly, we're seeing that people have the jobs their fathers have." As, as she's sitting right next to Justin, <laughs> trying to become prime minister, of course, right? And she's saying this is a bad thing because ostensibly the the Liberal Party cares about inequality of opportunity, right? So it's like it's part of that it's part of that discussion, right? So the the, the disconnect and Justin actually does look a little uncomfortable because he's not he's not he's not a stupid person. I think he right. sees the the hypocrisy there. But I think you know you're right in saying that they're they're very different. I mean I think there are some similarities, of course. One, they were both relatively politically neophytes. Justin less. Justin had been an MP for almost ten years when he'd become prime minister. Uh, he had never been a cabinet minister, say, in those, those early liberal years, and he had never, you know, because he came in around the at, at, at junior in the fall of the kind of liberal regime, and he was never, I think, seen as, you know, a key kind of critic necessarily, but but he was there. He had a kind of uh, that political role, whereas Pierre kind of in 65 became an MP, and then by 68 was, was prime minister, right? Uh, it's a three-year a three-year turnaround, basically. So they're quick rises. They're both relatively young for becoming prime ministers. You know, Trudeau senior uh, in his late 40s, and then you know, which is which is still you know somewhat young, and 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 Justin especially kind of in his early mid 40s, you know, is quite young to become a prime minister. There's there's certainly that comparison. There's certainly the comparison that they both of them, in a sense, derive some of their popularity off being seen as. Of hip and young and modern. I mean, you know, Paul Litt, one of the things he talks about in his in his book on Trudeau mania is how Trudeau encapsulated the kind of mod sensibilities of like the late '60s. And Justin, in a sense, captures the kind of cool the cool hip factor of the kind of social media age in a way that you know even even Barack Obama, for instance, uh, didn't quite capture in the same way. You know, so there's all of that, but in a lot of ways they're quite different. I mean, Pierre Trudeau was an intellectual. You know, whatever you think of him, he was an intellectual. He's a person who derived a lot of his meaning, I think, from from being uh, somebody who was a writer, who was a, a, a scholar, who was uh, somebody who, who who thought about the world in, in, in sometimes very abstract and very broad terms. You know, while his son, I think, is 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 more of a kind of standard, you know, politician. You know, 
often a comparison made is, is less to, uh, to less to his father and more to uh, his grandfather Jimmy Gardner. Yeah, sorry, if I get the name correct. But but he, what, he you know his his on his mother's side again there's like long liberal lineages, and on his mother's side there is that more of the traditional kind of politician, the fundraiser, the backroom guy, that kind of work that that's important. But that was very much not Pierre, at least not in his early years, where he was he was he was not in that vein. And again, you know, I think one is is much more, I guess, in a sense, they were both uh, good with the public. But I see like Justin is more effortlessly extroverted, whereas Pierre Trudeau, I, in my perspective at least, had to kind of work towards that. Like that wasn't in his comfort zone; he had to kind of push beyond it. Whereas I don't know if Justin would be comfortable you know in in the process of writing and research for instance right and, and i think you're you're right that people are very much the product of their era and, and justin trudeau say what you want about him you're absolutely right that he is very good uh, of, of managing social media even like the the stuff that obviously doesn't matter but people really seem to enjoy like when he photo bombs people and he just sort of appears or he's running behind a wedding and he's any photo bombs, right? He's just sort of there in in a way that he he definitely understands the 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 machinations of of how social media works. But let's talk about so uh, Jimmy Sinclair, by the way. Um, yeah, sorry, yes, yeah. So yeah, I, yeah, I just looked that up. Yes, so Jimmy yeah. Sinclair, the uh, grandfather and uh, uh, obviously very prominent political figure in his own right. So yeah, very much a, a, a dynasty. I, I want to start, before we get into anything too deep, the difference between capital L liberal and small l liberal, because when I'm teaching first year history courses, now to be fair, I've only taught the first year history courses to international students who have different frameworks for these these terms, but it's one of the more complicated things. And, and I know in the book, you ha- obviously have to make a distinction between capital L liberal, small l liberal, so just in, in a sort of simplified way to help frame our conversation, how do you differentiate between those two terms and how are they used in the book? Well, you know, in general, and I think I would agree, this is something that uh, when I teach, you know, uh, pol- political, any kind of political history, either in a political history course, of course, but even in a survey where the week's topic tends to be political, you do have to kind of make the distinction. And generally, when we say capital L liberals, we're generally in Canada, at least referring to the liberal party, either the federal liberal party or one of the provincial liberal parties. So the Justin Trudeau is the current leader of the capital L liberal capital P party. But the idea of liberalism as an ideology, as a as a, a way of thinking, as a you know general movement of thought, that is generally not capitalized, and that is a small L. Much like how you could have the Social Democratic Party in Germany, and the S and the D would be capitalized or the conservative party in Canada where the C would be capitalized, conservatism and social democracy, in a sense, as ideologies, are not. So that's kind of the general distinction. And, and in Canada, you would say that, that you know, the Liberal Party obviously refers to the party itself and, and it as an organization and is a, as, a, as a, a historical institution and, and all of those things. And, and liberalism itself refers to, I think, the broader ideology which is predicated on and this might be controversial, but my view is that liberalism is largely predicated on uh, less individual freedom necessarily, but more uh, the centrality of the right of private property to their political project. And that's mm-hmm. what defines liberalism. So for my context, when I refer to liberals, I don't just refer to people who would generally be seen as those within the liberal party, although I would say that pretty much everyone in the liberal party is liberals, but not everyone who is a liberal is in the liberal party, kind of like uh, all, all, all thumbs are fingers, but not all fingers right. are thumbs. <laughs> But so to say that in, in, the, in the Canadian historical context and contemporary context, uh, most every Liberal Party member is a Liberal. Uh, every single Conservative Party member in Canada is likely a Liberal and elected official. Uh, and even a few new, uh, a few new Democrats would, would maybe be considered Liberals in their philosophical overview, although the majority of new Democrats would likely be Social Democrats. Or um, Some people make the difference between social democracy and democratic socialism. I tend not to, but... But, you know, that, that would kind of be the general sense. So when we speak of liberalism in this book, we really see, we speak of like the, the a philosophy underpinned by the general view that what, what substantiates freedom and what substantiates the rights of the individual is that in that person's ability to own, pop, to, to own private property. And, of course, when we say that, we don't necessarily have to mean that liberalism is, is one monolith and that, for instance, the liberals and conservatives in Canada who are – 
both liberal parties or, for instance, the Democrats and Republicans in the United States who are both liberal parties, uh, not that they, of course, don't have uh, many often uh, substantive uh, disagreements, but from my perspective, I see them as almost, in a sense, family feuds rather than fundamentally disagreements between different ideological schools, whereas, and this is one thing I note in the book, uh, my view is that, that, that social democracy, as represented by the CCF NDP, forms a fundamentally different approach to politics and worldview than you see from both the liberals and conservatives, who I see as kind of on the other side of the political divide in Canada, which is one of the goals of my project, is to look at a fundamentally this interplay between socialism and liberalism in Canada and how Trudeau kind of forms a really good intellectual linchpin to kind of carry that narrative through from the 40s to the to the 90s. So let's let's get into Pierre a little bit more. So one of the things that you're doing with this book is you're trying to challenge the dominant narrative that exists around Pierre Trudeau that he was a real champion of the left. Is is that a fair simplification of what you're doing? Yeah, no, I think so. Can I, you know, in, in from my perspective, the literature on Trudeau you know, there, obviously there had been some writing of Trudeau on the left, some of it in Quebec, uh, a good chunk of it in Quebec from the kind of Quebec nationalist left, uh, both scholarly and kind of polemical, if you will, sometimes a little bit of both. And of course, in, in English Canada, there had been some work done by people like Reg Whitaker, but more at the kind of article level rather than at the book level. So in the terms of the big, broad projects on Trudeau, there's really two camps. The smaller camp generally kind of rejected, although it probably has a significant following among you know, regular Canadians is that Trudeau was a secret communist. That Trudeau was, he, he had been to Moscow and China and Cuba, and he was uh, a secret communist that was, uh, who wanted to use, in what we might call today, cultural Marxism, and what, you know, the certain certain strands of the internet right might call cultural Marxism to, to destroy, you know, Canadian society through, you know, gay marriage and through social equality and through, uh, uh, you know, alliances with Castro and, and, and all of that. Uh, so that's one narrative, and to a very degree, there are different hyperbole. A recent book on that, which has some value, although there there are some limitations to the book, of course. Uh, it doesn't really delve too much into the archives themselves. Bob uh, Plamondon's new book on on Trudeau, it's called The Truth About Trudeau. Uh, it's kind of seen as a, 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 a right-wing take, in a sense, on Pierre Trudeau as a socialist, both before and, and during his political career. Uh, but the dominant narrative, and I, and I think this is largely captured, of course there are differences, between the projects of the kind of existing works on Trudeau is they're generally, I feel, come from a kind of small L and big L, small and or big L liberal approach, which is to kind of say that Trudeau was a radical kind of uh, progressive in his er, like late late youth and early adulthood. Um, the early works kind of show Trudeau as almost in a sense a corporatist, a fascist adjacent uh, during his youth. But by, by the time he became, by the time he started to study at the at the postgraduate level, that had kind of uh, melted away, and he became kind of a socialist in their perspective. But then over time, learned that he needed to be a pragmatic yet progressive liberal. So for a lot of people, Trudeau has the vision of he was this passionate young radical, and you know he got rid of a lot of that because that's what you have to do to succeed in politics. You have to be pragmatic and relatively centrist. But at the end of the day, he was always a progressive when it counted. So it kind of romanticizes the the quote-unquote activist center that, that Kathleen Wynne tried to capture, this kind of quote-unquote the pragmatic progressive that we're, you know, we're, 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 we're not anti-business, but we're pro-people or something, that kind of thing, right? And it, it, it kind of serves that narrative of Trudeau as being, of being on the left, if you will. And so my argument, and I think that's the dominant narrative of Trudeau, is he's seen as He's seen as a kind of being a leftist, especially on social issues, you know, gay marriage, uh, you know, liberalizing things around abortion, of course, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, although there, there are issues with that from a left perspective, in my view. But, you know, in my perspective, I wanted to look at Trudeau, you know, from an intellectual perspective, from his economic policies, from some of his social policies, and say, look, this guy actually, in many ways, if not being Canada's first neoliberal prime minister lays the intellectual in some case pol in some cases policy frameworks down to, to kind of create to kind of usher in Canada's neoliberal age. Which is to put another way, it doesn't just pop in like Deus Machina from Reagan or Thatcher or Mulroney. It actually starts in many ways through a lot of the policies that, that Trudeau enacts, not just in the later stages of a government, but as early as nineteen sixty eight. And so that's a, kind of one of the narratives I'm trying to show is that Trudeau in many ways continues the, the broad tradition which is that he's primarily 
a small L liberal who predicates his political project on the preservation and expansion of private property. Uh, and in that sense, and I note this later in the book, I say conservatives might cringe at the notion, but Trudeau is much more uh, of their ilk than he is of the NDP's ilk. So when the conservative kind of movement in Canada vilifies Trudeau so much, my argument is that Trudeau in many ways helped create the society that you're trying to create right now. The thing that strikes me is that I, there's two main reasons for me why Pierre Trudeau gets held up as a champion of the left. Yeah. One is is when he, or I guess three, one is when he comes to power, right? This is a wave of, uh, you know, youth and, and counterculture and, you know, Woodstock is, you know, all this is going on, right? And while it's happening primarily in the United States, Canada is certainly not immune. And then he's friends with Fidel Castro and he has the whole, the government has no place in people's bedrooms. So th these are the things that largely get identified with him. And you're right, largely on social issues, but one of the things that strikes me is that for as much as, yes, he was a capital L liberal prime minister, he was also just, a, as you say, a small L liberal prime minister that he didn't really view the economic side of things as though the government's responsible for giving people jobs. And I know you talk a lot about protection and worker protection, that he, he wasn't a big proponent of that. And it strikes me that rather than sort of hold him up as this champion of the left, I think what you're doing, and, and it's probably rightfully so, is just, as you say, that the title of the book is The Constant Liberal, is that he took the, if you're t trying to take the phrase liberal, like he is sort of exhibit A of what a liberal is, small l liberal is. Yeah, no, certainly those first three things you talk about, I think like that early period is, is very fascinating. You know, you look, this idea that Trudeau is kind of coming out at 68 as this, as this this radical time, and it certainly is not just in Canada and the United States, but across Europe, yeah. uh, including you know on both sides of the quote unquote Iron Curtain. In some ways, there's there's youth largely driven by the youth of those mm -hmm. nations, and then that's all in addition to the continued rise of decolonialism and in in Asia and Africa and South America and all of these you know interrelated projects. And I think there's been a lot of interest, obviously, uh, in this past year about like 1968 as a global kind of, of, of movement um, but you know I think from from my view of Trudeau I, when you note like Trudeau as you know this idea that you know he's he's coming up at this moment that's certainly true but Trudeau really pains himself to, to to try to dull some of those things Trudeau in 1968 for instance makes it clear that um, he feels the government shouldn't be seen as a quote-unquote Santa Claus he feels that people are, are, are seeing the government giving away free goodies and that Trudeau says that, well, we're, we're done with that if I'm prime minister. And it sounds almost like something, honestly, without hyperbole, you'd hear from Fox News, right. from the, 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 the opinion pages of, of one of the Sun Media or National Post or Post Media um, you know, uh, papers, uh, not something that you'd see even in the Toronto Star, let alone what you'd see on a kind of left-wing publication. But, and also, you know, this idea of the Trudeau kind of, the, the state has no business in the bedrooms of the nation, certainly that's that's a, a watershed moment for like kind of the progressive left on, on social issues, and, and, I, and I wouldn't discount that, but Trudeau's motivation in a lot of these challenges to social mores is almost Nietzschean. It's almost in a sense, and I note this in the book a little bit, where Trudeau says, you know, the goal of, is to free the individual from tradition and free the individual from from like the things holding them back, almost in a sense that you must free the truly exceptional from the bonds of, of the mediocre, of right. the regular people. And that through these kind of things, we free people from, from that so they, so they may succeed. And I know for, for a small uh, liberal, I think that's their definition of the kind of the goal of an individualist society. But somebody from, I think, the broader left, both, you know, maybe the communist left, but also, you know, the Christian left, the more communitarian leftist strands, that's deeply antisocial, and it's deeply, it, it's deeply, I think, challenging to this idea of solidarity. The, you know, the community matters, and in Trudeau, in a sense, is saying, well, no, community doesn't matter. All community does is hold back the truly exceptional. Mm. So, you know, it, you know, that's kind of, in a sense, what he's trying to to say when he's talking about some of those things. And so, you know, I, I think in, in '68, also, I think another factor is that, and I've noted this in actually in reviews of, of lit, and 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 Robert Wright is a, a, an, another historian who's kind of written a book on. The Rise of Trudeau, and he, the, both of those books were published in 2016, and I did a review of both of those books, and I note that I think you know more could have been said in those those otherwise excellent books about how, and it's not that they don't talk about it, but but it could be a, a greater focus, is how 1968 was in a sense the quelling of a potential leftist moment by the election of someone like Tommy Douglas, who maybe didn't look the part as a young, fresh politician. If you look at him, he's, 
it almost has a Bernie Sanders yeah. type flair with his hair, and that uh, you know now yeah. it's ironic he would be seen as the hip young thing because that's kind of what the what young people seem to want is the kind of anti like you know they 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 love the the, the Jeremy Corbyn Bernie Sanders that kind of you know old gray-haired person that remembers the world before neoliberalism existed but, but Douglas kind of had the more radical revolutionary visionary program on most every issue um, and so Trudeau was you know came around at the perfect time to offer what people thought that change could look like without actually having to give it in a sense and that's one of my views is that Trudeau is the perfect kind of antidote to the uh, to the radicalism of the 60s because he gave enough of it to satiate people without actually you know being a real challenge because at the end of the day this is this again we have to remind people this is at a time where the average liberal voter in the country didn't necessarily have a say at the convention this is not like today where with the liberals conservatives and ndp anybody who holds a membership in the party can effectively vote for leader at this time you needed to be selected as a delegate from a riding association right. or through another means you know being a, a sitting officer so having some other kind of way of getting to the conference. And so, you know, at the end of the day, Trudeau did have to convince the party apparatus. He did have to convince the Bay Street boys and, and all of that, that at the end of the day, despite the fact that he wore an ascot and, and sandals to parliament, that he had the same elite education, the same seven figure bank account and the same general derision for social equality. And I think that's that that was important for him becoming the prime minister at, at a time where, you know, the, effectively he needed to convince his own party. But it strikes me, though, that it speaks to the nature of power in pretty much the entirety of this country's history is like who who gets in power. And an argument that I constantly get into with friends of mine who are conservatives is that on economic issues, I find that the Conservative Party of Canada, the Liberal Party of Canada are going to do relatively the same thing. I mean, in my lifetime, the Conservative Party, for instance, has run up the deficit almost just as much as the Liberal Party of Canada. So I vote on social issues because I feel so economically they're largely going to do the same stuff or comp comparable stuff anyway. And yet here we have a situation with Pierre Trudeau is like, like you say, like he, he can be held up as a leftist figure, but economically he's part of this elite rich culture that has no real interest, personal interest in changing the, the overall economic structure in the country. And that's why to me, when you look at Pierre Trudeau and, and you sort of talk about left, right, or, or sort of legacy, that for me it is those social issues because I, I don't, I can't think of a prime minister who has radically altered the economic structure in this country ever. And I mean, yeah, the the only exceptions would be you know perhaps King after World War II. I mean, you could talk about that and uh -huh. whether the motivations were to ultimately preserve capitalism. Of course they were. You know, the, the, the sheer change of what Canada looked like in 1939 versus what it looked like in, say, 1947 in terms right. of, like, social programs, the, the collective bargaining regimes. But, you, but you're right in noting that. And I think that's important to know, and that's kind of what I want to talk about is that Trudeau is seen as somebody who was, was like, this socialist prime minister. You know, and a lot of the, the kind of, I would say, more pro-liberal writers, I mean, Alan Mills, who wrote, a, I think, a, a, a very kind of strong analysis of Trudeau during his kind of uh, middling years from, say, 44 you know, kind of his return from Harvard, if you will, or sorry, his his kind of his graduate school days until his his start of politics. And he makes the case that Trudeau was always a social democrat and certainly was a social democrat when he became liberal leader. Right. And I've even, you know, other works have said, um, you know, Paul uh, Kenneth Dewar's work on um, on Frank Underhill. It's not really about Trudeau, but notes that in Canada, the real distinction is between the liberals and the NDP on one side and the conservatives on the other. So I think you know that view is actually quite controversial, and and my my counter argument to that from a content from both a contemporary and historical perspective is just simply to note at the end of the day, when um, where in any province where the CCF NDP has formed government more than once, the Liberal Party or the Conservative Party effectively becomes uh, irrelevant, and they effectively merge as a party. So the only four provinces, uh, the only three provinces where the NDP has formed government more than once are Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and BC. And in every one of those provinces, uh, you, you have an effective conservative liberal alliance. Right. Uh, and in BC, it's the BC Liberals. In Manitoba, it's the Manitoba PCs. And in uh, in Saskatchewan, it's the Saskatchewan Party. And, and effectively, in, in Alberta, um, the NDP is uh, it looks to be coming the, the kind of broad 
anything but conservative alliance yeah. uh, there. So I guess from my perspective, you know, yeah, it's certainly on the social issues. But again, in 68, there's clearly the idea that there is an economic alternative and it comes in the form of, of, of the new Democrats. But it's, it doesn't, for whatever reason, get the same kind of play, because at the end of the day, there's a clear desire for social change. But Trudeau is able to articulate that in a manner that limits the potential like a factors of that, that of that change. And also what Litt's book shows and Litt's not a conspiracy theorist. And he's 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 careful to note that he's not arguing this was a conspiracy, but he does note the fact that Trudeau was the plum pick of of the of the Toronto faculty clubs and of the of the English and French elite media that of, that covered national issues that in Toronto and Ottawa and Montreal the people who knew Trudeau they were all of this kind of male Anglo or Franco Canadian uh, upper class highly educated usually at some of the best schools in Canada but often also often at some of the best schools of Britain France and 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 United States and so you know Trudeau was able to effectively capture that that media interest as well. At the same time, how much does the fact that politically, you, know, you can say that, you know, in, inside some of these groups, it, you know, it's very insular and, and whatever, but how much actual political capital is there in suggesting radical change, radical leftist change? Because I, I, I honestly wonder if there is enough of, of an electorate to make that successful. I mean, you, you, you pointed out that there are certain provinces in which it's worked, but at a national level, obviously it's never happened, partly because of the way the, that elections are structured. But is, is one of the reasons that we haven't seen it is that there isn't a political desire for it on the part of the electorate at a scale large enough that it could work politically. I mean, you know, that's, that's an interesting question. I think the point I argue at some cases, though, is that People see that Trudeau did offer that and that Trudeau is seen, I guess, simultaneously, um, you, you know, the CBC a bunch of years ago did their, you know, their greatest Canadians yeah. ever series. And Trudeau was number three or four on the Tommy Douglas one. Yeah. But but Trudeau was in the top five. And yet there was a similar survey done at a similar time of the worst Canadians all time. And Trudeau was also in the top five of that. <laughs> so he's incredibly divisive. And I don't yeah. think anybody else, like Douglas, for instance, wasn't anywhere near the, the worst Canadians list. But, you know, so Trudeau was in the company of Paul Bernardo, for instance. Right? <laughs> On, and, of course, like, you know, that's just that's politics and right. the fact that, you know, boomers, uh, even still today, but certainly 10, 15 years ago, formed such a big co part of our kind of collective memory that they would – the boomers that liked Trudeau would remember him as great and boomers that didn't would remember him as awful. Mm -hmm. There would be no surprise he would be at the top of both lists. But my from my perspective, I think, you know, the, 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 the point I make about Trudeau is that he – he, he could have made some of these broader changes if he wanted to. And it's not just that he d didn't move us in a left direction. It's that Trudeau actively moved us away from a lot of the things that had been happening under Lester Pearson. Hmm. And of course, Lester Pearson had three kind of minority governments. So he was more dependent on the NDP, whereas Trudeau, you know, his, he, in 68, he won a majority, in 72, a minority, in 74, a majority, in 79, he lost, but then came back in 80. To another majority government before retiring in '84. So Trudeau, for all but two of his years, um, or all but three of his years, two and a half of his years, if you will, um, governed in a majority context, which gave him more power to actually implement his vision. So that's certainly part of it, the political realities. But but you know, a lot of the expansion of the kind of social systems happened under liberal governments. It happened and un happens under King and Saint Laurent, and in many ways, especially under Pearson, in some ways. Um, and Trudeau is the one. That, 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 that quells a lot of that, actually, and, and then that is the one to try to reverse the trend, talking about Santa Claus uh, and how he, the government can't be seen like a Santa Claus and, and lowering the expectations of the working class and, and scaling back uh, spending on programs and talking about bringing back means-tested social programs uh, and all of these kinds of things. And, and it's Trudeau starting these conversations. It's Trudeau legitimizing these conversations. And there was a great piece... That I, that I cited in this book, it was written in Queen's Quarterly and the Contemporaries, written in the mid-70s um, by, a, by a journalist at the time. And it was a very thoughtful piece. And one thing he said was, Trudeau is different than most prime ministers and most heads of state even, in that when he gives a speech, he will, he will, he'll give a speech that doesn't even necessarily have policy objective. You know, nowadays, right. you know, every, every time the prime minister or president speaks, there's kind of a short-term goal to it. But with Trudeau, he really – he would just get on TV and lecture people like the kind of scholar he was. He would 
He would get on TV or on the radio or both or what have you, and he would lecture people. And it wouldn't be about a direct policy sometimes. He would just go on and kind of talk about this vision. So one of the, the goals of this project is to say, well, what was Trudeau's vision? And my view is that Trudeau's vision was, a, was one of, of the kind of the rolling back of the kind of post-war compromise that saw a general improvement of worker standards and of social equality in favor of a return to the more – what Trudeau thought, the, 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 the common sense of liberal society, which is that wealth must come from the capitalist first. You know, trickle-down economics is generally the best way to go. That um, Canada Canada has to have weaker labor standards, longer hours, lower pay, because that's the only way we can compete with the rest of the world. And that was where all Trudeau's ideas. Now you make a good point in noting that, and this is something in the book that I that I noted, and 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 frankly was one of the 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 bigger questions uh, I I dealt with in my my revision process was to what degree can Trudeau be affecting all of this? Because Trudeau is a prime minister, and he's again he's a prime minister in a majority government situation. Um, and a Canadian prime minister with a majority is amongst the most powerful people in, in democratic societies anywhere. They they really have no effective checks or balances on their power, especially in a pre kind of charter of rights understanding of the Supreme Court, where the, the Supreme Court has almost a quasi legislative function. Mm -hmm. um, Trudeau had almost unilateral power in, in some ways, but he was still the leader of a middling power that was you know being tugged by the will of the American political system he still had to deal with globalization so that is something I, I i try to talk to you about is that you know trudeau i think does have this vision of re-establishing small l liberal values in canada yet is also being forced onto some of those ideas by changes abroad through automation through uh outsourcing through the rise of of, of japan and and the of, of part of uh, other parts of East Asia as legitimate competitors with the Canadian economy, the rise of the the far uh, not the far right of course, but the rise of, of of the neoliberal right in the United States, lowering labor standards there, forcing Canada into difficult competitive positions. You know, all of those things certainly matter. But but my view is that in looking at Trudeau, I think his vision is not only that oh it's not that he you know didn't want to call for you know a, the abolition of private property. It's that Trudeau in many ways wanted to fight any kind of preservation of what had existed kind of in the uh, uh, you know in the 40s and 50s and 60s and sort of the post-war compromise All right, well i also want to talk a little bit about organized labor in this story because obviously it's, it's in the subtitle so obviously it's a major part of what you're talking about in the book but one of the things that, that's really interesting to me is that in this country you have certainly the the liberal party of canada and but you have a party to the left of it whereas the case that we always look at, just because it's right next door, is the United States, where you have the Democrat Party, but who are also centrist, slightly left, but there's no one really to the left of them. So unions go strongly to the Democrats. In Canada, unions are largely associated with the NDP across the country. So here we have a situation where we have Pierre Trudeau, who, as we've talked about, is viewed very much as a leftist figure, and yet his relationship with organized labor is perhaps not what you would expect for someone who would have the reputation of being a major leftist figure in this country. So how does organized labor then fit in to the story? Well, you know, it, it's, it's one of the things that you can try to thread through. And that's why my first two chapters, one deals with Trudeau and labor, and one deals with Trudeau and the CCF, uh, CCF NDP, largely in Quebec, but not specifically in Quebec. And the reason I look at that is that Trudeau, again, comes back from his studies abroad. He studies, for instance, at Harvard, uh, where he finishes his uh, start. Uh, he finishes kind of his master's education and then heads off to the London School of Economics to study with Harold Lasky, who was you know, a towering figure on the British left. He was both as a scholar but also within the British Labour Party, but you know, as, a, as, a, as a kind of committed socialist. Trudeau studied with, with these important thinkers and uh, never ended up finishing or really even starting his doctoral uh, dissertation but eventually came back to Canada and became convinced that Quebec was this backward society, that the leadership of Quebec, the economic, the religious, the social leadership of, of Quebec was, was trapped in a 19th or even 18th century mentality, and that this was preventing Quebec from becoming truly modern, truly progressive, truly competitive with English Canada, truly integrated into the kind of way of life of, of of British society. Trudeau, in a sense, was almost an Anglophile. He really felt that the British system had, 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 had was superior, and while he didn't necessarily support, in a sense, saying, 
you know, Quebec's conquest was a good thing, he did say in a sense that Quebec always rejected the gift in a sense of British democracy. Uh, mm. and, and he felt that that, that that needed to kind of be more established. So Trudeau had this real veneration for that. And he said that one of the reasons is that there hadn't been the, the, this like engine of progress. So if Trudeau looked at Quebec and he saw you know a deficit of civil liberty, he saw backwards uh, understandings of labor relations and of class relations. And Trudeau looked to the Liberal Party in Quebec and the Liberal Party federally and saw parties willing to sell out civil liberties for political expediency. And he, you know, through the Liberals made no real opposition to the Padlock Act in Quebec. Of course, the Canadian federal Liberals violated systematically the rights of Japanese Canadians. And, and Trudeau saw the CCF, and he saw in the CCF the party that consistently stood for civil liberty of, of Japanese Canadians. Of, of religious minorities and, and, and so on. And with labor, he saw them, again, as a, as a force standing for civil liberty because at the end of the day, in, in his view at the time at least, um, the right to strike and the right to bargain collectively were all kind of part of these basic rights of representation and assembly, uh, you know, these fundamental 1700s kind of liberal freedoms. And Trudeau saw in labor and the left the only allies he could have towards making Quebec a small L liberal society. Now, my view is that Quebec was already a small little liberal society and had been since the 1840s along with the rest of Canada because, again, it was fundamentally based on the, the reverence of private property. That's what defines, in my view, a liberal society, and Quebec undoubtedly had a reverence for private property uh, during the Duplessis era. But besides that, that was Trudeau's vision. So tr labor and the left were his allies in that sense. What ends up happening, though, is that he becomes more and more convinced that you need a kind of anything but Duplessis, an ABD, if you will, alliance. <laughs> To defeat him both within parliament you know so Trudeau through like through the you know he tries briefly to form a political party called the Union de Force Democratique which the basic goal of which was to unite the liberals and, and, and CCFers in Quebec uh, to form that kind of new political party to stop him but more informally but maybe more importantly through like uh, you know intellectual discussions about trying to kind of build this 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 liberal again small l liberal um movement against Duplessis, and Trudeau became increasingly convinced that Quebec was, was in a sense, a pre-liberal society, that Quebec was almost, in a sense, not yet ready for democracy. And so he felt that we couldn't even speak about socialism and about those things until we had won liberalism. So Trudeau basically, at that point, kind of jettisoned the left and, to a lesser degree, jettisoned labor to kind of more focus on the like burgeoning liberal project in Quebec. And although he never signed up for the Liberal Party at that point, he became more sympathetic to them and more critical of, of the NDP. And not more critical of labor necessarily, but just more disconnected from labor. Uh, when he becomes prime minister, however, I think Trudeau doesn't see the same value in an alliance with labor and the left. Because whereas in, in 1950s and early 60s Quebec, the left was, I think, to Trudeau, integral in, in, in modernizing Quebec society and bringing it into the, into the present. By the 60s, Trudeau really had this, I think, feeling that, uh, that that liberal society was imperiled, not from the right necessarily, but from the left almost. Trudeau really had this fear of expectations. And there's a, a piece by an American sociologist in Trudeau's files who's a small L liberal, but what you might call a kind of right winger, who says that modern American liberalism, and when I use that term in that context, say he means the broader American left. Hmm. You know, liberal as, yeah. a, as a standard for left, where I use liberal largely as covering the broad uh, conservative uh, conservative party, liberal party uh, part of Canadian politics, which is to say the majority of it. Um, he uses that in the terms of liberal as in, as in left, and he said that what the, the leftists and their demands for more rights and more freedoms and more expectations and more social programs and all of these things is like this is going to imperil capitalism. We need to get back to the fundamental 1800s, 1700s understanding of liberalism. And it was in a sense said that, that the social progressives or the economic progressives, but even in some cases the social progressives, were in a sense trying to almost drive a Leninist plot to destroy capitalism through the increase of expectations. And Trudeau, I think, internalized some of that. Where from, from day one, one of his key goals was to limit the expectation of Canadians for a better life, especially economically. He really felt they needed to be taught through both policy and through rhetoric that life wasn't going to get a whole lot better and if it was going to get better it was only going to get better by empowering capital and, and getting them to be profitable and then they'll share the wealth through better jobs but 
the, the, but we have to, to get better, we have to almost, in a sense, get worse. And that was one of Trudeau's notions. And of course, that didn't apply to him and people of his class. Right. It didn't apply to the idea that greed, greed was still good in, in a Gordon Gecko kind of understanding. Greed was still good uh, for the elites. But for the working class Canadian, he was seen as, as a traitor if he bargained for 6% versus 5% in his collective bargaining agreement. And, and, and that was kind of the key goal. So whereas, again, labor and the left Labour and the CCF NDP in Trudeau's earlier years are seen as the engine of progress. Now they're seen as a barrier towards the liberal reforms that are needed to make Canada a more competitive country and a, and a, and a country better conducive to wealth production um, rather than the distribution. Because Trudeau was convinced from 1968 onward that Canada's path for Canada could not afford the social programs that it currently had, and certainly the ones that some people wanted to create. Canada needed to create more wealth. Well, I think, you know, from, from, from the less perspective at the time, they felt Canada was an unimaginably wealthy society in historical terms. And it, should it wish, it could have provided every man, woman, and child with housing and education and food, uh, but chose not to because of political priorities. And I think that was a difference of opinion between Trudeau and, and the left. So for me, I think understanding Trudeau is really important because of what you're saying here is that. He, the, the reputation that he may have now doesn't necessarily really fit in terms of what he actually did. And what's important about that, I think, is for us as a country to truly understand what is important or, or how we got to this point or really who we are is understanding the people who have who have sort of created the structure in which we all live now. And having Pierre Trudeau recasting him or, or reinterpreting him and fully understanding him as who he was as opposed to the reputation that he has can help us situate ourselves today, which is why I think it's really important that all these things have come out about him because he is such a luminary figure and such a powerful figure in the second half of the 20th century. So that would be sort of my plug in, in helping to under, like almost get people to buy the book because it, re, it helps us understand this. But it, would that be the same? Would you take the same approach to that in, in that understanding him is important not just because of what he did and from the from the historian's perspective of it's important to know try, try and get an accurate representation of people in their time and all that but also because he still holds a lot of influence and the things that he did have sway both positively and negatively as you mentioned some people really hate him right if you go to bc for instance there's not a lot of love for pierre trudeau in bc but a lot of people love him as well like, so it, it strikes me that really understanding him goes beyond just recasting the historical record, but truly situating ourselves today and understanding the way in which the political powers have been exercised in this country and continue to be. No, I think that's a great point. And you're right that that's, it captures to a large degree one of the purposes of the project is when we think of like Canada over the last 40 years, you know, there are narratives about, you know, growing inequality, the, the, the rising gap between wages and profitability, the kind of growing, you know, the, the many of the issues facing millennials around housing and, and job security and all those sorts of things. And it's like, well, it wasn't always this way. And when was it not this way? Well, you know, the change didn't happen all of a sudden, but really you go back to the 70s in some ways and say it was different in the 70s. And this is not necessarily to romanticize things. There were certain things that for, especially for certain marginalized populations, that you know things are or, or are better now than they've ever been, and and that's not to discount that, but to, to note rather that, you know, um, in the 1960s and 1970s we were a much more egalitarian society on economic terms, and we were certainly trending towards more egalitarianism and not less. Mm. And I think that's important to note, even if you know there were still battles to be won afterwards. The trends were kind of in a in a more egalitarian direction, and one of my goals is to show that Trudeau is the start, in many ways, uh, of this of this uh, current against egalitarianism, this current against equality in Canada, especially on economic terms. And my goal in showing that is saying that when we look at you know the rise of the of, of modern conservatism, of the of the right, of of neoliberalism, whatever you want to call it, of the more pro capital age we live in. Uh, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, I think if you think it's a good thing, I think then a lot of conservatives need to look at Trudeau in a much more positive light than they have and say, this is the guy that, that helped us crush the unions. Right. This is the guy that, that really taught people in an intellectual sense 
uh, that 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 greed was good when it came from from the rich, but not when it came from them. And that that's Trudeau kind of helped create the modern common sense of our pro business world. And it was Trudeau that created a charter of rights and freedoms that yes, a lot of conservatives, especially social conservatives, do not like, but which laid the groundwork against inc- the inclusion of of the right to food, the right to shelter, the right to post secondary education, and those things that I think a lot of people do see as should see and do see as as, as something akin to a right. And hmm. so if you're and if you think that the, the rise of neoliberalism is a bad thing, and you see yourself maybe in the part in the liberal party vein, well, you could say in many ways there's a big disconnect there because the, one of Trudeau's key legacies, in my view, is the creation of this of this more inegalitarian ca- Canada. And I note in the book that Trudeau's policies, Trudeau's Charter of Rights, by the time that he leaves political life, Trudeau has undoubtedly made Canada a more equal society between within each social class. You know, never before had French Canadians had the rights that they had, and I think that's extremely important. Before Trudeau, you know, French Canadians had great difficulties, you know, within the civil service. You know, there are stories of Jean Chrétien who, you know, ironically being prime minister much later than Trudeau, started his political career before Trudeau because he had such yeah. a long uh, career. Yeah. But Jean Chrétien talking about how he really couldn't even talk French in the House of Commons. It was, it was these great difficulties, these great inequalities for French Canadians in, in public life in Canada. And that was, of course, totally upended by, by, the, end of, by the end of Trudeau's time in power to the point now where Trudeau made the, pro- the prophecy that being able to speak French was going to be seen as a status symbol in this country. And it often is. It's, it's a marker that really inflames certain class divisions where a lot of working class Anglophones have great difficulties uh, obtaining that training because the, sometimes the schools in their areas don't offer it and access to French education is seen as as a as a tool of a, a kind of class mobility in a sense, and, and Trudeau Trudeau helped make that a reality by 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 allowing francophones to be seen as as something approaching equals within the federal public service and within the federal government, and all of that is extremely important. But my perspective is that he helped create that vision. It's 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 also and the same thing from the left. Uh, a, a piece I've I've written that's coming out in a great edited collection on the CCF NDP later this year. I look at Douglas and Lewis and Broadbent. Kind of growing out of the research out of this book, a lot of this is, a lot of that research is in this book as well. The book is also, in a sense, a book about labor and the NDP, as much as it is just about Trudeau. Um, right. But I note there that you know, for those on the, the in the NDP who who you know who summoned da- David Lewis and, and Ed Broadbent and, and Tommy Douglas to be their visionaries, you know, you have to look at these men for the deep anti-capitalists that they were in the 1970s. And that that's their legacy. So I guess with Trudeau, my, my goal is saying that his legacy is is a in a sense a a a, a pro capital one, um, and that that's fine. You know, I, I mean, I have my position. Obviously, I, I generally see Trudeau's role in that process as, as being a bad one for working class Canadians and, and therefore most Canadians. But people could read my book and say, well, Trudeau is the hero that Canada needed. He was the one that saved us from 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 socialism he's the one that saved us from uh the kind of the 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 broken post-war compromise that was too hard on business and that was too egalitarian in its approach and he was the one that really uh helped us reach this more individualistic more competitive more more unequal post 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 cold war world post 1984 world and and uh, he maybe deserved credit for that so that is definitely my approach and that is one of the goals and, and every one of my chat i kind of know you know in my chapter on inflation one of the things I argue, and it's based on uh, research both here in Canada and the U.S., is that you know, Trudeau's efforts to control wages and prices fail somewhat. They fail to control prices, but Trudeau becomes very successful at keeping wages down through his uh, infl- anti-inflationary programs. And in many ways, if you look at in Canada and the U.S., when wages and, and, and profits begin to really spread, because from World War II to about the early to mid-1970s, Profits and wages usually rose together. Profits would usually rise first, and then workers, either because they had collective bargaining or because of more distributive policies, what have you, would, would rise along with it. But in the mid-1970s, Trudeau's policies being a key impact here, that's when the gap starts to grow, and the gap has never shrunk since. Because Trudeau was instrumental at creating, through again, through, through hard-nosed policy that effectively banned the right to bargain collectively. But, but also through his ability to convince Canadians that they needed to accept less from their work lives and less from their social programs, he was able to kind of create this, this, this growing gap of inequality that was instrumental under the Mulroney and Chrétien Martin years in building the kind of Canada we have today.
uh, you know, the neoliberal Canada. It starts with Trudeau. And, and that's why people should go pick up the book. And again, the title is The Constant Liberal, Pierre Trudeau, Organized Labor, and the Canadian Social Democratic Left. Christo Avalis. Again, I, I always feel like I say your name wrong. I have to say that. Okay, <laughs> um, uh, Shirk, postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto. Uh, thanks so much for doing this again. Thanks for having me again. And, and we should say, too, you are, of course, uh, an editor with Active History. And so this is an a Active History on Active History podcast. We, we've done very few of them, but, you know, always happy to promote a fellow editor. So in addition to the book, and, and you mentioned the other book that you're, you're going to be involved in, check out Christo's work at Active History, a bunch of stuff up there. So if you just go to the site and, and search Christo's name, you can find a bunch of stuff. And with respect to The Constant Liberal, already has a paperback release of November the 1st from UBC Press. So if you want to wait for that, you can I encourage you to get either version of it. Uh, I'm yeah. sure there's also an ebook version. Yeah, currently right now there is the uh, there is an ebook and a hardcover. You know the the hardcover of course is is, is very pricey as they often are. I mean so I mean unless you you know if you want a physical copy the the general uh, sense is that you you would wait uh, until until November. Of course though at certain book fairs at certain academic conferences they often have advanced paperback copies, but that's really hit or miss. Yeah. So right now, if you do want a copy at an accessible price, you know, the, you could certainly pick one up uh, uh, on ebook, and you know that it's a similar price to the uh, the paperback. And of course, you know, maybe this is something you wouldn't say as an author, but of course, the book is now increasingly available at, at university and public libraries for those who uh, who prefer to access books in that sense. Yes, and as an author, I, I will. Uh, if you're not aware of this, the Public Lending Rights Commission is a good place to go too. So, uh, so yeah, so if people get the book out of the library uh, or demand that your local library get the book, it can help uh, the author as well. So, uh, so certainly check out the book. And again, The Constant Liberal, Pierre Trudeau, Organized Labor, and The Canadian Social Democratic Left. Christo, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. All right. If you have any questions or comments for the podcast, historyslam at gmail.com. Twitter is at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.